ओम शुक्लांबरदरम विष्णु शशिवर्ण चतुर्भुज प्रसन्न वदनम ध्यानोपात सरस्वती नमस्तुभ्यं वरदे कामिणी विद्यारंभ क्या सिद्धिर्भवत मे सदा गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरसाक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम सो लास्ट टाइम वी वर् लुकिंग एट लिंगपुराण एंड वी डिस्कस्ड अबउट द षाक्षर सॉरी द द्वादाक्षर मंत्र ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो दिस इज दिस द्वादाक्षर मंत्र दट ऑल ऑफ अस आर चैंटिंग कॉमनली दैट इज अ पार्ट ऑफ लिंग पुराण अगेन डिस्मिंग ऑल बिलीव दैट द्वादश द द्वादाक्षरी मंत्र ऑफ लॉर्ड कृष्ण इट्स इज इंक्लूडेड इन द लिंग पुराण ओंडी सो दैट अगेन लिंग पुराण वन ऑफ the puranas and rays of lord shiva so the the dwadashakshari mantra has got a place in linga purana again as i told you dismissing all the facts of discrimination between shaivism vaishnavism and so okay we'll continue so next is the shadakshara mantra now what is the shadakshara mantra let's have a look anyone can guess the shadakshara mantra what is the shadakshara mantra Count for yourself is Om Namo Narayana the mantra. Om Namo Narayana ya is a shtaakshara mantra. Om Namo Shivaya. Om Namo Shivaya. So Om Namo Shivaya is a shtaakshara mantra. So the Linga Purana has got reference to both the Dwada Shakshara mantra Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya as well as the shtaakshara mantra that is Om Namo Shivaya. So the next is Om Namo Shivaya and now. describing the greatness or significance of this shadakshara mantra it says that it is the supreme among all mantras and for this also there is a story it seems that there was a brahman he was called as dundamuka dundamuka and uh, it is uh, said that due to some maybe he got distracted in his life now just as all of us also If, even though a person is very good but still at some point of time we also get distracted we may go on the wrong path and so on but of course so this is human nature but then we must try to bring ourselves on the right path right path back again and for this of course the grace of the lord is very much needed so this brahman also he was very much very good but then ultimately he got distracted and it seems that his wife she gave birth to a child on an amavasya and usually amavasya we consider to be like an inauspicious day and so on we do the tarpana But then the birth took place on that day, so even they could not help it. And the astrologers who had come there during the childbirth, they predicted that the newborn child will not have a very good future. So that was their predictions. And uh, this child also, as he grew up, he was very sinful. His behavior was very bad. And uh, it is uh, said that uh, this Dundamuka, this Brahmin, he married his son also to a particular family. but uh, it is even though he married it seems that this uh, man he developed intimacy he got attracted towards other women and so on apart from his own wife so once it so happened that so basically he was married to a wife but then she he was not whom dunda mukha's own father had married him but then he did not live with her for very long and it so happened that he started living with some other woman and one fine day it so happened that both of them were fighting with each other and while they were fighting it seems that he hit that other woman on whom he was attracted and it seems that he killed her and uh, all the family members they came to know about her death and it is said that they retaliated they wanted to give back what they did is they killed this brahmin dundamukha his wife and their original daughter in law that is the original wife of this son who was there now it is is now this dundamukha son the son who had committed this crime he was not present at that house during when this incident happened therefore he survived and it is uh, said that now he was very angry when he returned back he got the news that all his members were killed it seems that he, he did not know what to do like his life was very much uh, you know into sorrow and so on so it so happened that he started wandering here and there and he reached a hermitage and there the sage who was there in that hermitage he was a great devotee of lord shiva and he was chanting this the shodaksh the shodashakshara mantra 
षडाक्षर मंत्र वी कॉल नॉट षोडश अक्षर षडाक्षर मंत्र एंड ही वॉज ऑल्सो डूइंग द पशुप्रत पशुपत व्रत दैट इज अ फ्यू पूजा एंड रिचुअल्स इन प्रेज ऑफ लॉर्ड शिव एंड इट इज सेट दैट ही वेन दिस दून द मुका सन he also came there he advised him saying that you are at a very wrong mood in your life but you can come here i will teach you the right path and so on and it is said that for 12 months continuously even this dundamukha san also did this pashupata vrata and continuously he also kept chanting this shadakshara mantra om namah shivaya and as a result of his devotion lord shiva also came there and it is said that he gave salvation to all his ancestors and moksha so this is a story of the shadakshara mantra saying that one even though irrespective of what you did in your previous birth the best example we can take of valmiki who was a great you can say a sinful decoy ratnakara earlier but the change in his life turned out to be very good and he is the author of ramayana that we have today so like this if at the right time if our life gets turned away if we get the right upadesha if we turn our life in the right way surely the results are many next is a story of lord pashupati that why shiva has got one name as pashupati that is the lord of all animals suta tells the sage shiladi shiladi if you remember in the last sessions we had seen about the sage shiladi who has a few doubts and he answers all those questions of devotees who keep questioning so once this suta he starts answering and it seems that once all of or sanat kumara sanat kumaras they went to the hermitage of the sage shiladi now the shiladi is a sage and they asked him a question saying that why lord shiva why lord shankara is called as pashupati is there any reason for that and uh, so this uh, sage shiladi he replied that all living beings including brahma have been referred as animals that is why man is also called a social animal right so now why this has happened is because of their desires because of worldly desires ignorance attachment to all worldly things so that is the reason even men as well as lord brahma and indra are also called as animals and lord shiva is the lord of all of them therefore he is called as pashupati and it is said that vishnu so the lord shiva he takes care or he is responsible of ruling over all the creatures who are there and lord vishnu through his knowledge he he bestows jnana yoga you get reference of this in the gita he bestows the knowledge of jnana yoga on all the devotees and that's how ultimately liberates so this is a belief that is mentioned in the linga purana now but without the blessings of both lord shiva and lord moksha none of us can attain liberation none of us can attain moksha next is the story of the lord maheshwara so you see it towards the end of the linga purana we have references of different names of lord shiva maheshwara it is said that maheshwara mainly means the liberated one or you can say the liberated there is nothing beyond that and lord shiva with now shiva this word itself shiva has a word and goddess parvati has got name shiva stri lingam so literally both mean happiness or you can say bliss so that is uh, the meaning of this word shiva ha shiva and maheshwara this meaning like one who is fully liberated there is nothing beyond that you can say the highest form that is there very difficult to reach at that point that is beyond any bondage you can consider people not having any bondage and so on that is this form of maheshwara now it is uh, said that lord shiva he manifests himself in the form of the sun god of the sun su and sun and the first ray is called amrita first ray is amrita wherein all the deities they get their power from there amrita is nectar the second ray is called chandra chandra moon god he is responsible for the preservation of medicinal herbs herbs that are there third is called shukla shukla graham we say shukla is responsible for propagating religiousness religion religiousness in the world and it also helps in growing food crops that is shukla this is a third ray fourth ray is harikesha these are all forms of shiva harikesha and it is said that all the constellations so like how we have the uh, constellations around milky way and so on all this they get nourishment after worshiping the fourth ray harikesha vishwakarma is a fifth ray that is the planet mercury sixth ray is sanya dwasu it is mars so these are all basically even the planets other planets like mercury mars jupiter they are also considered to be a form of lord shiva only and they are given these names sanya dwasu is mars 
Seventh ray is Arvavasu. Arvavasu is the planet Jupiter. Arvavasu is Jupiter. Surata. Surata is the eighth ray that nurtures the planet Saturn. Saturn. And the ninth ray. So Lord Shiva mainly he manifests in different forms. And the ninth ray is Sushumna. Sushumna or Sushumana you can say. It is responsible for nurturing the moon, planets, so everything, the entire universe in general. So like this, Lord Shiva is the one who rules over all these planetary bodies also. So this is the significance. Further, we see that, yes, you want to ask something? Sorry? Chandrika ji, your voice is not clear. What I heard is, can you repeat the names, right? You just refer to the recording. I've just said, right? So you can just ah. refer and listen. Yeah? Okay. okay. Huh. Now towards the end of the Linga Purana, we have the greatness of Shiva that is spoken about. Uh, and then we also have a concept called Shiva Tattva. Shiva Tattva is nothing but Shiva who is called with through different names. That is Shiva Tattva. Now, next is there are different mantras or the greatness of Shiva is Shiva's Ashutoshi. He can be pleased, he can be made happy very easily. You just chant his names or you perform some yajna. And once it is said that Lord Shiva was one sitting in the middle, he was surrounded by all gods around him. And at that time, all the gods asked him that you tell me about your own self. Your self is very mysterious. So all the gods ask Shiva that you tell me about yourself, how you, are this, how you got this form and so on. Right? So Lord Shiva says that I am present right from the beginning of time. And I am going to be present forever. So there is going to be no end for me. And everything originates in me. It gets submerged in me. Like this is somewhat you can consider this to be like the Gita that we have. Bhagavad Gita wherein Lord in the Vishwarupa Darshana you see right. Krishna tells Arjuna all the beings come from me. They come back in me and so on. So this is somewhat similar to that. And he says I am truth himself. I am the form of the four Vedas. I am light, darkness. I am only uh, I'm, I also form the three principal gods Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and so on. So mainly he enlightens all the gods talking about his mysterious self. Further is the importance of a guru is mentioned in the Linga Purana. Now it is said that a devotee should start doing Shiva Puja. Now many of our houses we have this tradition of Shiva Puja that is being done and then it is passed down through generations to generations. Now usually whenever you see a person it doesn't happen that the person would have started Shiva Puja all by himself. Of course, if you have a Shivalinga at their home, maybe you do the Abhisheka, you offer flowers, that is different. But you go to certain families, they have this tradition of doing the Shiva Puja. And the same Shivalinga would have passed on from one generation to another. Because in today's times, it is very difficult to see. Like, there are it's such a sad state that there are no people to do the Puja. So ultimately, you go and give the Shivalinga and everything maybe to a nearby temple. Or maybe to people who do and all that. That should not be done. So that's how when it when the tradition gets passed on from one generation to another, this you take a diksha from the guru. So maybe from the father, if it passes through the son, the father is like the guru for the son. The son learns the proper methods of doing the puja and everything. So it is said that one a person who is has a proper knowledge, only that person should be regarded as a guru. And the shiva puja, shiva worship should started only after taking proper permission from the guru after learning all the right methods of worship and uh, it is said that this guru who is there now it can be any guru maybe you go and approach some other teacher from outside or whoever it is the person should be the right person now we cannot just go and chant uh, just go and pick up anyone just for the sake of getting a guru the guru also should be the right match that is he should fulfill all the qualities that a guru should have he should also be equally knowledgeable and then uh, it is said that in olden times, people used to make offerings of ghee. That is, the in the fire, offerings of ghee used to be made. And 108 times the chanting of the Aghora Mantra. Aghora Mantra are few mantras in praise of Lord Shiva. So like this, like a homakunda sacrifice used to be uh, done. And that's how it is uh, said that the puja used to start. That is, after doing the yajna only, the guru used to give the upadesha to the disciple and that's how you have the Omkara Mantra, Om, the mantra that we chant, Pranama Mantra, Omkara Mantra that is chanted, then different shlokas like Rudra Ashtadhyaya, Rudra Ashtadhyaya, this is a particular topic in praise of Shiva worship or any stotras, anything in praise of Lord Shiva can be chanted. Then ashes, that is Vibhuti is applied all over the body which is very much dear to Lord Shiva and then actually the puja starts. 
next is how should uh, the shivalinga be worshipped the uh, be installed now it is said that uh, a devotee should always install a shivalinga made of either gold silver or copper so these are all in traditionally we say all such things but uh, today's times so what we can see is we usually get it of black marble right so that also can be done and it should be installed in the puja room itself. that is in the altar where we have other gods and everything there only it has to be installed and shivalinga it symbolizes goddess uma also there is goddess parvati and it is said that while we chant mantras lord brahma also should be uh, like we must think about brahma so brahma is also living there at the base of the shivalinga that is you can say whenever you have the shivalinga at the base below the shivalinga vishnu at the center so like this just to show the significance of all the three gods then proper rituals everything must be done shivalinga should be adorned with clothes and all the different pujas all that should be performed clothes is the vesti the white color dhoti that we offer then different mantras should be uh, chanted and that's how in praise of brahma vishnu and gayatri these mantras should also be chanted now all this is done when we are installing the shivalinga for the first time then different ways of worshiping are also mentioned like for example uh, some people if you see uh, they will do the abhisheka then offer flowers or some people they will just keep chanting the shlokas and directly offer flowers show the nevidya do the arati so like this there are different methods that are mentioned we can follow whichever method we like but there are certain methods that are told for the shivalinga also the basic is the installation of shivalinga and so on so all that in detail is mentioned in the linga purana then uh, towards the end of the linga purana if you see different types of yoga yoga shastram has been mentioned not exactly is yoga shastram now the first type of yoga is mantra yoga which most of us we do we chant different mantras and mainly now when we chant this mantras it is a, it should be a state of dhyana that is meditation we just close our eyes we try to concentrate our mind mainly second is sparsha yoga that is different pranayama exercises in the first yoga mantra yoga we just close our eyes sit still and uh, think of the lord second is yoga is called sparsha yoga third type is bhava yoga bhava yoga in this or you can call it the bhava yoga not bhava bhava yoga in that the person totally is engrossed in the thoughts of lord mahadeva that is you are just thinking about the lord only continuously fourth type is abhava yoga abhava yoga is wherein you can consider the next stage of bhava yoga wherein no other thoughts come in so these are all with practice all this will come and the fifth is maha yoga wherein it is for yogis and sanyasis you can consider that the self gets united with the supreme only okay just uh, two minutes and just come i think there's some network issue that is there yeah sorry now can everyone hear me yeah, yeah. okay so uh, yeah so you're talking about yoga and the last stage of yoga is going to be maha yoga maha yoga what happens is we the person it's usually for sanyasis and so on wherein we feel that our form the entire form is attached to the form of lord shiva himself so mainly the ways of yoga also are mentioned in the linga purana now with this the linga purana ends to an extent and of course you have many other aspects that are mentioned in the linga purana to some extent we have seen the gist of the entire linga purana now it has in all about 11000 verses and it says that the study of the linga purana fulfills all the four aspirations that we have dharma artha kama and moksha and ultimately it will also help a person to attain liberation that is moksha okay so with this we will end with linga purana did everyone understand linga purana yes clear okay next now obviously obviously now everyone because there are many topics that are covered under one purana it is always better that you go through the recordings and everything as and when you get time so that things are very much clear okay next purana that we start with that is going to be markandeya purana markandeya purana again one of the 18 puranas now this purana in all it consists of about 16 chapters it consists of 16 chapters so once it so happened now what is the introduction is once jaimini jaimini is a sage and 
Jaimini was a disciple of sage Vedavyasa. He was a disciple of sage Vedavyasa. And uh, he expressed his curiosity before Markandeya. Markandeya, a great disciple. And uh, he says that now Markandeya is among the the eighth Chiranjeevi is Markandeya. We have seven Chiranjeevis. Out of that, the eighth Chiranjeevi is Markandeya. And he, you know, just to give you a bit of a background of Markandeya, was actually a sage. He was uh, born to a sage Mrikanda and his wife Manaswini. And he also ultimately turned out to be a sage. So basically, the Markandeya Purana is a conversation between sage Markandeya and sage Jaimini. And there are a chapters in the Srimad Bhagavatam also we get the reference and even in the Mahabharata. And once it so happened that this, the main story is how Shiva protects Markandeya from death and so on. So mainly if you see, Markandeya, he was a great, uh, more than Markandeya, his father Mrikanda. He was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. And Markandeya is said to be a great devotee of Lord Vishnu. This reference we get in the Srimad Bhagavata Purana. So, Markandeya Purana basically is a conversation between sage Jaimini and Markandeya. So, once Jaimini asked that, he asked a question to Markandeya. Uh, that uh, in the Mahabharata, you have aspects of dharma, artha, kama and moksha. That is, you have good things as well as even things that are mentioned in the Mahabharata. So, what do you think? Like, what is your... But sometimes, like, when we read the Mahabharata, there are a few things which we feel... Uh, like... Now, it need not be limited only to the Mahabharata. It can be anything, like anything, even if I am speaking something, it's not that everyone will agree to that, right? Now, there can be a few points wherein you disagree or you will have your own opinions on that. So, then like this, Jaimini also had, like basically it was a conversation, it was a difference of opinions. So, Jaimini wanted an answer to all his questions. And uh, he says that I want to, he approaches Markandeya and Jaimini tells Markandeya that I want to achieve knowledge. I want to know the Mahabharata whole and soul. You please uh, tell me about uh, Mahabharata. So he says, what happened? Like, what do you want to know about Mahabharata and so on? So he says, no, no, I want to know in general the story. Uh, not in general. Basically, I want to know the, all the detail aspects. So that why? So, and he asks a few questions saying that, why the Lord himself had to take a human incarnation in the form of Krishna, that is a Purna Avatara and so on. So like this, many questions Jaimini asks Markandeya. So Markandeya, he says that presently I am a bit busy, I have to do, now this is Markandeya Purana, okay. Uh, Shyamala ji just joined in, so I told you. And uh, Markandeya, he was engaged in, so Markandeya says, he tells Jaimini that, now presently I am doing my evening worship, it is my evening puja time. So now it will not be possible for me to answer all your questions. Uh, but uh, I'll just tell you, there are a bit of birds who are there, birds, P-I-R-D-S. And they will narrate whatever you want to know and they will remove all your doubts and everything will be clear. Now, these are the sons of the great bird, Drona. They, they are called as Pingaksha, Vibhoda, Suputra, Sumaka and so on. They stay, these are all the names of birds and they stay in the caves of the hills of Vindya Archana, Vindya Parvata. And they know the Vedas and everything. You go and ask them, they will clear all your doubts. So Markandeya's words, they surprised Jaimini and uh, to confirm because he could not believe in the first instance, he confirmed and he asked again. He says that it is so surprising that the birds can narrate the contents of the Mahabharata and they also know about the Vedas. You say, how is this possible? And now first you tell me how they got so much of knowledge, then I will decide whether I should go and ask them or not. Markandeya says that, so he tells a story. He says that there was a garden called Nandanavana and there... Uh, Indra, Narada and some people were present there. Once and so now it was uh, Indra, Indra had built this beautiful garden, Nandanvana. So it was a lot of trees, flowers, plants and so on. So Indra was nicely enjoying in this garden or you can call it even as a forest, the Nandanvana forest. And at that time Narada came there and Indra welcomed Narada, offered him a seat, that is honored him and so on. And uh, now Indra was there along with a lot of his attendants. So at that time Indra then asks Narada. He says that uh, what do you want? You want to listen to a song? I'll order the Gandharvas to sing a song for you. Or you want to watch them dance? I will order the Apsaras. Menaka, Ramba, Mishra Keshi, Udvashi. These are all different ap Apsaras. They can dance for you. Or you want something different? You tell me. What do you want? You tell me. Whatever you desire, I'm ready to give you. Narada says that I want to see an Apsara dance who is very superior in beauty, he tells this. 
now there were many apsaras who were there i named a few menaka ramba mishra keshi urvashi punji kastala and so on so narada had told that the most beautiful amongst all the apsaras they will dance now the apsaras started having an argument saying that who is the most beautiful amongst us so they had a fight amongst themselves and because each of them felt that they were very beautiful they were very talented and so on and narada then said that i will now to test your beauty what you can do is say durvasa he is doing tapasya you try to distract him some way and whoever does this whoever can distract him that apsara will be considered the most beautiful and uh, they said that all this uh, we cannot uh, do because durvasa they knew his anger and at that time it became very and they uh, they were at that time very much afraid of even durvasa's uh, curse and they felt helpless that is they they immediately and clearly told narada that this would not be possible for us so we will tell another apsara who is there amongst us her name, her name was vapu so she can easily go and she can easily distract durvasa as per your needs so basically narada indra and all such people if you see sometimes they will do such things like which is not needed at all but just to you know they might have some purpose behind it narada will have some purpose but then still uh, some things like this maybe to create fights and all that, sometimes such things are done so this vapu this apsara was sent to distract uh, durvasa and she began to sing a song uh, and somehow as soon as she started singing she sang it so beautifully that ultimately durvasa got attracted that is durvasa basically he got distracted you can say and he started uh, looking here and there who was singing and so on and durvasa he went in search of who was singing this song and he finally found this apsara vapu and durvasa he later he understood that this vapu vapu had come to disturb his tapasya and he cursed that for the next 16 years he cursed this apsara vapu that for the next 16 years he will have to take a birth like a bird and uh, but you will not bear a child a child will never be born to you you will be killed by a weapon so that you can regain back your apsara form after saying this the durvasa went away from there now markandeya says further so with this the story ends and further markandeya he continues that markand uh, in the lineage of garuda of garuda the king of birds there were two brothers kanka and kandara kanka and kandara and there was a demon vidryudrupa vidyut rupa vidyut rupa and uh, he was actually he was uh, sitting in his private chambers with his wife and he was enjoying wine and it seems that kanka this bird once he visited kailasa this demon was sitting there vidyut rupa with his wife in his private chamber and at the time this seeing this bird would come there this demon he got very angry and he said that at a wrong time when i am sitting with my wife alone you have come here to disturb me and uh, it is uh, said that he told kanka how dare and he got angry on kanka but now this kanka bird also was not very easy to leave him he said that this i have come to the mountain i have not entered your chambers just now he had not entered his actually the room where he was living just outside the window he was so then kanka this bird also said that kailasa is a mountain that is open for everyone it does not belong to you i have not come inside your house therefore you have got no right to tell me anything but the demon was not ready to accept this he got very angry and it is said that this kanka uh, this demon he took his sword in order to kill this bird kanka and the kanka bird was killed so getting the news of this kandara the other bird hearing the news of his brother's death and kandara he took a resolve that i am going to kill this demon vidyudrupa now after doing all the last rites of his brother kanka this kandara this bird also arrived at the kailasa mountain and it seems that at that time again this avidyu drupa he was drinking wine and everything with his wife he was fully intoxicated and again looking at the second bird kandara the demon lost his temper again he got angry and kandara he then challenged the demon saying that you should have a fight with me directly you don't lift your sword like my brother did we will have a fight with us and at that time a battle started and it seems that kandara this bird it ultimately it killed the demon and the demon's wife her name was madanika it seems that she accepted kandara she was very helpless she did not know what to do so she accepted kandara this bird as her husband 
and it is said that now this Kandara he finally he returned back to his own palace. Now this Madanika she was the daughter of Menaka, another Apsara Menaka, and it seems that she had a will she could change her disguise as per she wa- want she could change her form. And after marrying Kandara it seems that she took the disguise of a bird, and this Madanika she was born as this elf Vapu in the next world. So Vapu who was cursed originally by Durvasa, this Madanika the wife. of the demon who was later married to kandara she was born as this apsara the the bird was born as apsara apsara vapu now to not get confused between the names please listen to the audio as and when you get time so that there is proper clarity now so with this kandara it seems that he named her tarkshi so these are all the names of the four birds that markandeya has mentioned now the second another instance wherein there was a person his name was mandapala he had four sons drona was the youngest amongst them and he had immense knowledge of the scriptures vedas and so on so uh, kandara he married his daughter tarkshi to drona so kandara's daughter tarkshi she was married to this drona and it seems that drona and tarkshi they started living happily together and when the battle of mahabharata was going on at that time tarkshi this uh, she conceived and uh, it seems that uh, while the battle was going on between arjuna and bhagdatta bhagdatta he was a king of prajyotishpura prajyotishpura again it is somewhat in the midst of india you can consider northern side madhya pradesh up that part this uh, war that is taking place it is in kurukshetra haryana so you are from the nearby regions so arjuna was fighting with the king And as Tarakshi, she just came running on the battlefield without any reason. She just came just to witness the war. And at that time, the arrow that was aimed at this Bhagdatta, who was the king of this Prajyotishpura, it went in the direction of Tarakshi. It struck in her abdomen, and it seems she was pregnant. She had conceived. The abdomen tore apart, stomach tore apart, and four eggs. It seems they fell on the ground. And at that time, how this is how the birds were born. Now, after the battle of Mahabharata was over. A sage, his name was Shami. He visited the battlefield and he spotted a bell there. Now, what was this bell? This bell had fallen from the neck of the elephant of Bhagdatta, the king whom with whom Arjuna was fighting. So it seemed that under the bell he heard the chirping of a few birds. Now these were the birds. These were the eggs of this bird Tarakshi, who had given birth to four eggs. Uh, who had given birth to four birds and. How they were left in the battlefield. So this Tarakshi, she died. When she died, the four eggs they fell down from her abdomen, and the king also, Bhagdatta also, his elephant was left, and the bell from the neck of the elephant had fallen down. So this bell had actually covered the four eggs. And when the sage Shami he visited this battlefield, he could hear the chirping sound of the birds coming under the bell. So he removed the bell and saw what it is, and he saw so few chicks there, and he uh, said that. he told he had a few disciples also along with him and he told his disciples at see if needed these birds could have died on day 1 itself but till date like maybe it was the game of destiny this bell has very nicely covered these four birds so surely these four birds are not just plain ordinary birds surely they are going to have some purpose in life that is reason their lives have been saved and then it is said that he told all his disciples that you carry these eggs to our hermitage let us take care of these birds there properly and the disciples did as they told further the sage shami he started taking care of all these birds and the chicks they grew feathers they began to fly here and there and so on and it is said that wherever they went they used to return to the hermitage by evening time and the birds also it seems that because they were learning living in that hermitage continuously listening to the vedic mantras discourses and everything they gained a lot of knowledge and uh, once when sage shami he was preaching he was teaching his disciples something and that time the birds came there and they told that like the, now these were all the clan of garuda so therefore they can speak they are not just 100% only birds so therefore they can they have a few uh, human qualities also so they can speak so they come and they tell uh, this uh, sage shami that you are a teacher you are like our father you have protected us you are a teacher because we have gained a lot of knowledge from you and now that we have grown up now you tell us what to do like life long we cannot stay under your protection and care right 
so now you also tell us something to do we will also consider that to be our duty and we will work towards that and uh, when the bird started speaking like this as learned people the sage was surprised and he asked the birds that first you tell me how did you learn to speak so clearly is there any curse or something or is there some past story that you have because it is very surprising first of all your birth itself is surprising new born chicks as destiny had it you were placed safely under a bell and that's how we came and rescued so what it is now the birds they remembered the past story of their birth and they tell that uh, in our previous births there was a sage now all these you can see the puranas how they are if you see it is a story within story and story 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 to, so to know one story there will be 10 inner stories so you have to be very uh, careful so don't get confused i hope till here everything is clear yes Yes, okay. Okay. So now these birds. So the sage asked the bird, saying that now you tell me what, like, what is your past story? And these four birds, they say that there was a, a sage in earlier time. He was called as Vipula Swan. Vipula Swan was a sage. He had two sons, Shukrisha and Tumbaru. And in our previous birth, we were the sons of this person called Shukrisha. And when our father and uncle both these Shukrisha and Tumbaru they were performing yagna, we bought all the necessary items that are needed and once indra he came to our hermitage disguised as a bird and uh, he was very aged also so he was starving so all of us we requested our father that uh, let us give him some food let us provide him with some food and it seems that that bird so the indra in the form of the bird he told that i want to eat human flesh i don't want any other food i want to eat human flesh so can you give me that so our father said that now we came back and these birds are telling the story so the birds they came back and they told their father that this is a condition that the bird is telling that it wants to eat human flesh it does not want any food so the father says okay you come back i will go and i'll try to speak to the bird he tries to tell the bird but then uh indra in the form of the bird does not listen and then our father comes back and he tells that no he is not listening but then someone has come to our place we believe in the principle of atithi devo bhava therefore we must offer whatever we have so saying so we all decided to donate our bodies the birds are saying that we all decided to donate our human bodies to the bird so that it can satisfy its hunger but we were very frightened now this not easy to kill someone right it's not easy to kill ourselves and offer to someone so we went and we told the bird straight forward that it is very difficult like you are demanding human flesh it is very difficult to kill ourselves and offer it to you but at the same time as told by our father we want to offer to it's not that we don't want to offer but practically and logically it is very difficult to cut off our own body and offer it so hope you understand we are in a very confused state so it is uh, said that all this conversation so the bird was not reacting at all indra in the form of the bird he was not reacting at all but our father was standing nearby he got very like he got tense because he said that i have promised to this bird that i'm going to donate and so on new people are not listening but it, it seems that the father he cursed all these sons that you will be born as birds in the next life and himself he he cursed us and he himself got ready to donate his own body and as our father was breathing his last it seems that indra he resumed his real form and he tells us age that i just took this uh, form just to test your character just to test you so kindly forgive and you desire what you want now and indra blessed our father saying that you will have divine knowledge lot of penance and be free from all obstacles problems and so on thereafter the birds are telling that we also fell at the feet of our father asked for forgiveness and requested him that you take back your curse who told us that in the next birth you should be born as birds please take us back then he said that once the curse has been made the words do not go waste so now he blessed us saying that even though you are born as birds you will have supreme knowledge that is the reason they are telling this age shami that today even why we are learned we have got so much of knowledge is because of the curse of our father who ultimately towards the end also blessed us with supreme knowledge and uh, now the birds tell the sage that now at least now we are very much uh, grown up you have taken good care of us and so on so now we also want to do our own duty so now you must leave us apart sage shami he told his disciples that 
see look from day one itself i had told you these are not just ordinary creatures these are not ordinary birds so they have even survived the battle of the mahabharata that shows their greatness and then sage shami he told the birds that you go back to vindhyachala now these are the in story one that we had seen about birds these are those same birds which jaimini is going to see which markandeya has told jaimini that you go and whatever doubts you have you go and ask these four birds these are those four birds who are living in the vindhyachala so all the story that i told you all this while it is how these birds were born and how they ultimately reached vindhyachala so shami he then told the four birds that you go to vindhyachala there you stay there and they passed their time by studying the vedas and doing tapasya as long as they lived there so sage jaimini has told by markandeya and after listening to the story of these birds he finally reached the vindhyachala mountains and he arrived before the birds and he says that oh birds i am jaimini i am the disciple of vedavyasa i have come here i want to have your glimpse i want to see you as told by markandeya i have reached here and the birds welcomed and saying that you are such a great sage we have learned, learned uh, heard <coughs> a lot about you it is our good fortune that you yourself have come here to meet us and uh, jaimini said that i have a purpose why i have visited you you just tell me and i have a few questions here and in the context of the mahabharata it is related to the mahabharata and i request you to answer all my questions the birds readily agreed and uh, he said that he started asking a few questions the first uh, question was which jaimini asked us why did the lord lord take human incarnation even though he is the cause of origin maintenance destruction and everything the lord is all my pity right still what was the reason of taking a human birth this was the first question of jaimini that he asked to the four birds the birds say that the almighty lord he is worshiped by all deities and the vishnu is originator then brahma is creation vedas appear from him and also at the feet of shiva shiva is known for destruction and so on and uh, therefore if you see it is the same god who takes incarnation like for example in different forms as times are needed the lord has to take a human incarnation so just as in amatsyavatara to save the four vedas because they were there inside the ocean the lord had to take the form of fish purmavatara he had to take to support the mandara mountain during the samudra mantana that is during the churning of the ocean varaha avatara he had to take the form of a boar so that he can rescue the earth from patala narasimha avatara he had to take to respect the curse that was given uh, respect the boon sorry that was given to hiranyakashipu no man no animal not during day time not during night time nobody should come and kill me therefore the lord had to take a half man half lion form narasimha form vamana avatara had to be taken dwarf boy then next was rama avatara and rama avatara only a man except a man none could kill ravana to fulfill that rama avatara had to be taken krishna avatara purna avatara for re establishing dharma so depending on the time periods and the needs the lord has to take a different the lord has to take different avataras so this is the reason why the lord had to take a human incarnation also now this question why he asked only for human incarnation is due to the context of mahabharata markandeya purana answers a lot of questions with regards to mahabharata so the first question of chaimini was answered next the birds say that the second question that was asked by chaimini was how how did draupadi how should how did she became the queen of the five pandavas now once it so happened that indra he had killed a demon now the birds are telling the story indra he had killed a demon called trishira trishira he was a son of toshta he was a son of toshta so this toshta he became very furious when he became very angry when he heard the death of his son and he it is said that from his hair lock from his data he just picked up one lock of hair and he offered it in the fire and when he just put it in the sacrificial fire a demon was born out of that he was called vritrasura and the main objective of vritrasura was to kill indra now learning about the birth of vritrasura again indra was very much afraid and he he sent the saptarishi saptarishis were there and say that you work something 
you have a pact something you do pact psc to pact you form something and ultimately you do something you work out something so that this demon can be killed now the saptarishis what is not they were sages ultimately they did not believe in fighting at all so they wanted to make a very nice friendship pact they wanted to develop friendship between indra and dhritarashtra but uh, indra had other ideas he said no no with the demon i cannot keep friendship because tomorrow we don't know where the situation will lead so by surprise what he did is somehow he managed to kill this demon dhritarashtra now it so happened that dhritarashtra this further now already indra had killed many demons earlier also so now all the demons they were all very much furious at indra and uh, it is said that the demons because of their reaction to indra's action they started troubling even common people innocent people say that even lord of earth prithvi also could not bear the burden of their atrocities and finally she approached the gods and she tells that these demons are too much to bear they are very terrible so now you find out a way so that i can get get rid of their burden and thus to relieve prithvi it is said that the the lord one by one all the gods they started to take an incarnation of earth now the atrocity is that acts of the demons were at such a level that one incarnation alone would not suffice therefore many gods had to take their incarnations dharma and vayu they were born that is they uh, came their radiance was seen in the womb of kunti it seems in the womb of uh, kunti dharma and vayu and arjuna uh, so the dharma vayu indra that's how we have yudhishthira bhima arjuna then yudhishthira and bhima were born next indra himself he gave the birth to arjuna nakula and sahadeva were due to dashvini kumaras who were born in the womb of madri thus all the panch pandavas were born from the same source it seems now this story we have the boon that was given to kunti and everything that is a common story mentioned in the mahabharata but this is another story that is mentioned in the markandeya purana now all the five pandavas were born and uh, the draupadi who was there she was none other than shuchi or you can call her shachi devi the wife of indra and thus in human incarnation also draupadi got the five pandavas as her husband so basically indra only was a person though indra had told dharma vayu ashwini kumaras to produce to implant themselves in the womb of kunti and madri still he was only one who had ultimately suggested all of them to be born so that the world can be relieved of the burden of demons that's how you have the kauravas and so many other demons were killed the mahabharata dharma yuddha as we say indra had only one wife shuchi shachi devi as we call or indraani and he was therefore draupadi also was indra's wife actually even in human incarnation but the other story that goes in the Ma- uh, mahabharata is that draupadi in her previous birth had asked for a boon saying that i need a person who's the knower of dharma i need a very physically strong person i need a great archer i need someone having a uh, very handsome look should be very intelligent and so on lord shiva she prays to lord shiva lord shiva at that time says that all these qualities to find in one person will be defi- very difficult in the next birth you will get five husbands each of them having each of these qualities that's how draupadi ended up marrying the five pancha pandavas the markandeya purana this is a bit different so this is how draupadi married the pancha pandavas second question of jaimini has been answered third question of jaimini was that how did balarama now balarama had it seems that he had incurred the sin of killing a brahmana so the next question a brahmin balarama krishna's brother balarama so what is the story about that let's see once it so happened that in the battle of mahabharata we know that balarama was very much impartial right from the uh, time right from earlier times he was like krishna was meant to break rules we have the very famous uh, uru bangam episode right when we have the gada yuddham between duryodhana and bhima at that time also krishna he tells bhima that he bit on the thigh of duryodhana which is against the rules of gada yuddham actually but still for establishing dharma when there is no other way we have to change our ways so therefore uh, balarama also did that so what happened uh, is that balarama gets very angry and he says that i don't want to fight for on the side of the pandavas kauravas nan i'll go on a pilgrimage and his wife revati also accompanied him on the pilgrimage and once while traveling it is uh, said that 
Balarama and Revati, they reached a hut. And in that hut, many Brahmins were listening and they were, uh, Sutta was also present there, they were listening to his discourses. And uh, it is said that when the Brahmins saw Balarama, they all stood up. He knew he was Krishna's brother, they all stood up, they felicitated, they felicitated him. Only Sutta did not stand at that time. Balarama felt very insulted and he at once he killed this Sutta. And when Balarama had seen, now Balarama had seen that uh, now they were going on a hermitage, so it was a mountainous area, just on the roadside. Now you don't get easily food and water that is there. So maybe he had drunk the juice of trees and so on. So which usually you can say like a bit of forest trees as we call. So maybe you can call them as wild trees, wild juices and everything he had drunk it seems. And that's why he was not in his actual senses too. So therefore in that rage and secondly Sutta did not get up to greet Balarama. So therefore in that rage he ended up killing Balarama. He ended up killing Sutta. But later Balarama he realized his mistake of killing a Brahmana. And he felt very guilty and it is said, said that Balarama immediately began to curse himself and it is said that I am going to observe a 12 year long fast to do the Prayaschitta for my sin. And it is uh, said that Balarama, he did that. He went to a place of pilgrimage. It is known as Pratiroma Saraswati. There he went and in order to carry out this tapasya of 12 years, that's where he went. And he started doing tapasya. Okay. Now, next is the killing of Draupadi's sons. Now, why were Draupadi's sons killed? Let's have a look at that. And the Treta Yuga, Treta Yuga, that is during the times of Rama, there was a king called Harishchandra. He was hunting in the Mahabahu forest forest called Mahabahu and he heard the cries of a woman there and save me, save me, the woman was shouting. So many women were there and Harishchandra also shouted loudly against the voice that was coming that don't be afraid and he immediately went in the direction of the cries. Now basically the cry was an illusion like how we have from the Ramayana reference you have Mari Charit crying in the form of a deer. Similarly, he said the cries however they were an illusion that was created by a person Vignaraja, Vignaraja lord of obstacles. So at that time Harishchandra heard those cries and said Vishwamitra he was also observing Tapasya in the nearby forest and now this Harishchandra is the same Harishchandra from the most famous movie also that we have read. Harishchandra, Satyavan Harishchandra, very truthful man. He was very virtuous and uh, Vignaraja it seems is the lord of obstacles he entered his body entered the body of Harishchandra and uh, Harishchandra he was actually a very pious and virtuous person but because of the influence of Vignaraja entering his body he turned out to be very wild he lost his temper he began to abuse Vishwamitra who was doing penance nearby and so on this further it angered Vishwamitra he cursed him and uh, he said that you are going to lose all your virtues good knowledge and everything Immediately Harishchandra he realizes his mistake and he begins to shiver. He begs the pardon of Vishwamitra. He says that it's my duty to protect the subjects. Kindly uh, forgive me and you tell me some way so that I can come out of this curse and I'll be forgiven. Vishwamitra said that if whatever you are saying is true, you say that you are a true follower of uh, religion, you take care of your subjects, you are a very good king and so on. So then you tell that I'll, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. If you give the right answer. I will I'll leave you, I will free you from this curse. He tells that, he asks the question, who should be given a donation? Who should be given a donation? Who should be protected? And who should be fought with? Harishchandra said that, donations should be given to only those priests and Brahmins who indulge in religious actions, who have, uh, who observe fasts and everything. That's basically, they are very pious and religious. So only to the right Brahmins donation should be given. Protection should be extended to those who are afraid. So to afraid people protection should be given. And battle should be fought with enemies. So this is the answer that Harishchandra gave. Further Vishwamitra asks him Dakshina for doing the Rajasurya Yajna and everything. So what he does later all that we will see in the next session tomorrow. For today we will stop it. Namaste. Hari Om. Start.
ओम शुक्लांबरधर विष्णु शशिवर्ण चतुर्भुज प्रसन्न वदनम ध्यापात सरस्वती नमस्तुभ्यम वरदे कामिणी विद्यारंभ क्या सद्यर्भव मे सदा गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुर साक्षा परब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम ओके सो वी वर् लुकिंग एट मारकंडेय पुराण वील कंटिव so markandeya purana if you remember yesterday when we uh, were seeing we had seen about vishwamitra vishwamitra and harishchandra so harishchandra finally meets vishwamitra and vishwamitra tells harishchandra that if you are a really a religious king you see that you know, you're a very great king you always speak the truth and so on then you give me some kind of dakshina that is you give me something in donation as charity harishchandra tell whatever you want to ask i will try my level best to give you whatever i can so vishwamitra just said that uh, i i am planning to do a rajasuya yajna like yudhishthira did from the mahabharata reference so i need some dakshina for that harishchandra said please say whatever you want and vishwamitra at that time says that give me everything that you have except yourself your wife and child apart from that whatever you have you have to donate everything to me harishchandra granted easily whatever vishwamitra desired everything he gave and vishwamitra then next he asked this kingdom the next question he asked that um after donating everything vishwamitra asks harishchandra a question he asked that who is the lord of your kingdom or who is the ruler of your kingdom harishchandra answered that now that i have given everything to you i have presented this kingdom to you you are now the master you are now the ruler of this kingdom vishwamitra said that if you say that i am the master of this kingdom then why are you still waiting here so vishwamitra was being very shrewd he said what are you still doing here immediately leave and before you leave you have to remove all your royal clothes ornaments everything you have to donate to me just wear there is a the tree is bark that is it just wear very simple clothes just to cover your body and leave all your royal clothes and ornaments here and just leave from here so thus harishchandra did that and after losing his kingdom and everything with his wife shaivya her name was shaivya and their son was rohitah so with both rohit and shaivya harishchandra left from the place vishwamitra then said that you are going without paying me do, any kind of donation what is this so now harishchandra was surprised he said that uh, i've donated my whole kingdom now what remains i've donated even my clothes and ornaments also what remains is just our bodies and you said that you i you don't need my body right so apart from that i have donated everything what else is remaining still you are saying that i have not donated for the rajasuya yagna so vishwamitra said that again he repeats say that you cannot leave without paying dakshina for the rajasuya yagna so but even now harishchandra's nature we must notice here harishchandra still he did not lose his temper now if it was for anyone else even after giving everything also if still the person says that you have not give, given anything obviously we are going to lose our temper right but still harishchandra did not get angry and he told very nicely he told vishwamitra that i have uh, given everything what i have but uh, like if you need something in terms of money or uh, in so whenever now i go back and whenever now that i have lost everything i have to put in a lot of efforts once i earn something i will surely pay your dakshina whatever you asked once i myself gain something now vishwamitra gets very angry and he says that you tell me the time when you will pay my dakshina or else i'm going to curse you he tells harishchandra said that you give me a one month's time i will try to pay the dakshina to you now thereafter harishchandra started living all the people the subjects in his kingdom they all felt very bad for their king and they also started following him and uh, it seems that harishchandra he took he took a halt in between and he saw that all his subjects all the people who were there in his kingdom they also started following him so now vishwamitra uh, got very angry and he said that what is this you have developed attachment towards your subjects that is the reason why even though um you have given your kingdom and everything to me still you are having some kind of um, at- attachment that is the reason all the subjects are following you what will i do with an empty kingdom so this is not fair and he cursed uh, he was he began to curse harishchandra he began to again shout at him at that time uh, harishchandra immediately he left the outskirts of the village also and uh, it is uh, said that uh, with his wife he somehow told all the subjects that you all also please go back otherwise this 
Vishwamitra as per he's going to get angry, he's going to curse me and so on. So it's better that all of you also go from here immediately. So now it so happened that uh, Harishchandra after telling this to his subjects, he left from the outskirts of the kingdom also with his wife and son. And uh, Vishwamitra it seems that now these are all Puranic stories. He in fact he came there to beat the queen it seems. With a stick in his hand he was about to be, beat the queen. So that she, you know, they immediately they go out. Now it seems that the guardian deities that are there of all the directions, east, west, north, south, all the directions there are deities, right? They all got very angry saying that this Rishi is trying to beat a woman that to the queen of this land. And it says that Vishwamitra he was a great Brahma Rishi and he cursed all those guardian deities saying that you are all going to take a birth as human beings. You will lose your godly status. And now this curse it frightened all those guardian deities and they asked for his, they asked for his pardon. Vishwamitra said that now that the curse has been given, it cannot be taken back. But now you will, uh, in the birth that you take, you will remain bachelors throughout your lives and you will never find attachment or anything for anybody. And thus it is said that those five sons of Draupadi, uh, those, these five uh, people of guardian deities, they took birth as the five sons of Draupadi. And of course, Dronacharya's son Ashwatthama ultimately killed them. Killed them. So this story that is there, it is actually how the birth of Draupadi's five sons took place. This is the background story of that. So now a question will come that Vishwamitra being such a great sage, how can he behave like this with Harishchandra? So we have one concept as destiny, right? For certain things to happen, a few things, like a few conditions have to be put up. So how the five sons of Draupadi were born, this is the story behind that. So therefore, Vishwamitra to some extent behaved like this with Harishchandra and his family. Okay, next. Now, next what happened with Harishchandra, let us see. So, after being thrown out uh, of his kingdom by Vishwamitra, Harishchandra, he reached Kashi, Varanasi. And there again, Harishchandra, he saw Vishwamitra standing in front of him. Vishwamitra now said, a month has been completed. You have promised that you will pay the Dakshana within one month's time. Where is the Dakshana? Harishchandra there, he is also very smart. He says that still half an hour is left for the completion of one month. You please... Wait, I will give you your Dakshana, don't worry. Vishwamitra said that I am going to come again after half an hour. And saying this, Vishwamitra went away from there. Then uh, Vishwamitra left now, Harishchandra started to worry. He said that very nicely, I told him half an hour is left. But what will happen in half an hour? Where will I bring the Dakshana? And if I don't keep the promise, I am going to be cursed. So what will happen? And at that time, his queen, Shaivya, she tries to console him, saying that uh, we already have a child. Now what, uh, you already have a child, Rohita. So now you do one thing, you try to sell me. Now this was um, like how today, in today's times, of course, we don't have this much. But uh, still in certain places, if you go, we have the selling that takes place, right, of children or one's wife, even women are sold about and so on. So this was those times, even in those times also, such things used to happen. So Harishchandra's wife told him that you sell me somewhere so that you get some wealth as Dakshina. And hearing to this words, Harishchandra fainted and he fell down. And... Uh, Thus, the queen also looking at her, looking at the condition of her husband, she also faints and falls down. Now, their son Rohit, he was very small, he did not know what to do, he began to cry. And at that time, Vishwamitra, he appeared there again and it seems that, now, even though in that unconscious state also, Vishwamitra turns that, please get up, uh, you have to pay me my Dakshina and your sorrows are only going to increase. There is no use of fainting, falling down and everything, you have to be right to your word. Harishchandra slowly, he got up, but... Seeing Vishwamitra again, he fainted and fell down. So now further he said that, further now Vishwamitra got angry. And he says that you have even little respect for me. You have to now immediately pay my Dakshina. I will wait till evening and if you are not going to do that, I am going to curse you. Vishwamitra saying so, he departed and now Harishchandra, though they got up, uh, Harishchandra did not know what to do. The queen also, she also regained her consciousness and she tells Harishchandra that you... Please sell me. Only if you sell me, we can get the money and you can pay the amount, pay the Dakshana to Vishwamitra. So finally, Harishchandra agrees and he decides. And he tells the crowd who was there in Varanasi that I am selling my wife who is dearer to me more than my life. And if anybody is interested, you want to buy her, you, you please do so before evening. And old Brahman comes from the crowd and says that I will buy her. Hearing so, Harishchandra became very sad because he did not want to lose his wife. The Brahmin then it seems that... Uh, he gave some money to Harishchandra and he took the queen. Now the son, uh, son, 
Rohit, he started crying. When he saw his mother going away, he started crying. And at that time, the queen, she requested the Brahmins in that, at least, let me see my son once and then I will come with you. And uh, then what happened is, it seems that she tried to console her son, but still, uh, when as the queen was going with her, with the Brahmin, the child, Rohit, the boy also started following her. Now it seems that the queen finally let anything happen. The Brahmin tried to drive the son away. He was taking just the wife, but still somehow the child was still following. It could not stay without its mother. So once it so happened is uh, the queen says that he tells the Brahmin that she tells the Brahmin that my son cannot live without me. So you do one thing that you buy this boy also. So Brahmin once again he gave some more money to Harish Chandra and he bought the boy also. And uh, Vishwamitra appeared at that time and he demanded the Dakshana. Harish Chandra gave him all the money. And uh, seeing that money, he said that um, you have given me such a small amount of money. Is this even Dakshina? I asked you Dakshina for doing a Rajasuya Yajna. What will happen with this small amount? Again, he gets angry. And uh, now Harishchandra said that you please wait a little more now. Uh, let me see if I can do something else. Now it is already evening time. So now Vishwamitra says only little time, only a quarter of a day or so is remaining. I will wait for this period. You see if you can do something. Harish Chandra once again he stands in front of the crowd and he says that now I myself am available for sale. If anyone wishes to buy me, you please come and buy me. At that time, uh, there was a Chandala. Chandala you can say like a beggar kind of a person, a mendicant, very unpleasant to look at. So he was stinking too. That is um, not very pleasant, not taking a bath, not very pure. So he was stinking, he had a very bad smell. A stinking body and he comes forward and he says Harishchandra that I am ready to buy you. Harishchandra asks who are you? And uh, the Chandala said that uh, I am a Chandala. Chandala is like the so called mendicants. My name is Praveer. I live in this very town and I wish to buy you as you say. And uh, at that time now Harishchandra he is a king and to now if someone is buying us that means surely we are like the slaves right of the person. So Still, uh, so Harishchandra says that it's better that I die and accept the curse of Vishwamitra than becoming your slave, right? So, at that time, rightly, Vishwamitra comes here again and he tells that this Chandala is ready to pay you so much of money. Still, why are you not accepting that? Uh, he gets angry. So, at that time, Harishchandra replies that I am born in the Surya Vamsha. He was an ancestor of Rama. I'm born in the Surya Vamsha. So, I cannot accept the slavery of this Chandala. Even though he is paying me a lot of money, I cannot uh, accept that. But uh, Vishwamitra, he tells Vishwamitra that I am ready to become your slave. I am ready to do whatever you want. So, I am... Vishwamitra also agrees. He said, okay, if you are my slave and if you are ready to obey whatever I say, I will sell you to this Tandala for 1000 gold coins. You have to go and become a slave. Now, um, it is uh, said that... Uh, this Tandala, now what he did, he was very happy that he had got Harishchandra under his control. He gave many villages, this and that, everything he gifted to Vishwamitra. Now, it so happened that finally, Harishchandra started living in the Chandala's house. And uh, slowly he started thinking about whatever had happened. He said, well, I've lost my wife, I've lost my son and so on. Finally, now what should I do? Uh, but still, there is no other way, this is how my life is, he accepts that. Now this Tandala was very smart. He appointed Harishchandra to take care of the cremation ground. So that is whenever a dead body comes to be present there, you have to take care of that. Let one one body be cremated, then wait for some time, then the next should come. So basically like to take care of the cremation ground, this was the job of Harishchandra. And uh, that way this was the work that was given and he felt very bad. But then Harishchandra said that this is how I have to work now. I lost my kingdom and everything. So, this is how I have to live all my life. And he was ready to accept. Though he was feeling very sad. Still, he felt that when my life is going to end, such thoughts started coming because he was in a very bad stage in his life. He had to live. Being such a great king, he had to now take care of the uh, cremation ground. But still, somehow he accepted and he started living. Now, one fine day, what happened is that a snake, uh, the boy, the Rohita, there, there's Harishchandra's son, a snake had bit this Rohita. Now at that time, their mother Shaivya. That boy, due to the snake bite, the boy died. Rohita died and his mother Shaivya, she brought Rohita to the same cremation ground where Harishchandra was uh, standing. 
and both of them they recognized each other and uh, but still harishchandra had a doubt shaivya the queen she immediately she recognized harishchandra but uh, still harishchandra also had recognized shaivya but then still he felt that maybe it can be anyone else also i don't know so let me not reveal anything but looking at the appearance of the boy she had bought him wrapped in a cloth so he felt that he belonged to some royal family just by looking at the boy so um, he asked the queen that um, who is this boy which family does he belong and i also have a son equal his age and so on and at that time the queen also the queen immediately knew that harishchandra has not recognized me so what she tells is uh, tells us why you have been living here you, you have a wife and son already our kingdom is lost our son is also lost so harishchandra now began to think that uh, who is this woman she is also talking about the same things that happened to my uh, wife and child maybe is she my wife and thus he recognized his wife immediately and their dead son and he began to cry loudly and uh, seeing their son's uh, condition now again both the queen and the king both harishchandra both of them they felt very bad and uh, immediately she asked harishchandra that why you are standing here you are living with a chandala and so on and uh, she then began to curse herself curse herself she belonged to keep uh, she began to keep names to herself that what is this condition that is happening with me i have lost everything my husband has become a chandala and so on and um, what of them all their experiences shaivya and rohita the queen and the boy they were living with that brahmin he was also ill treating them child was also lost now harishchandra was living under the control of a chandala so they were telling each other stories and uh, at that time what happened is that uh, it is uh, said that still they kept on doing this they did not even uh, one minute or for a second also they did not feel that we should leave apart our responsibilities and so on but uh, both of them decide that let us do one thing when we burn the dead pyre of our son let us also just uh, die in that only because there is no use of living such a life nor can we tell the brahmin nor the chandala that uh, we don't want to live such a life right so like this when they were making all the arrangements and they were praying to the lord at that time all the deities all the gods dharma sage vishwamitra everyone came there they praised harishchandra and they said that this was like a testing period for you and you along with your wife and son you are very fortunate you have won the hearts of everyone and along with your son and wife we are going to give you a place in heaven and immediately indra he sprinkled some amrita sanjeevan amrita amrita on the dead son rohita he also gained up consciousness and all of them were given divine clothes garlands and everything but harishchandra but even at that time what harishchandra said is that though all of you gods everyone has come here still i must take the permission of the chandala under whose control i am so without that i will not come so at that time dharma he said that dharma now this chandala was there he was lord dharma himself so dharma he said dharma he was also present there he said that i was only that chandala and just to test you i had come here so once again indra said that okay now that you know all the story come to heaven now still harishchandra he said that no 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 i have to go back to my kingdom kosala desha kosala desha ayodhya surya vamsha so i have to, he belong to surya vamsha so he, be, he ruled over the kosala kingdom so he said that my su- subjects are waiting for me they had followed uh, me all that long i had to send them away because vishamitra was continuously coming he had some he was immediately telling that the subject should not follow you so i have i have left them all back so i have to return because they are all waiting for me and it seems that then all the gods said that okay all of you go back to ayodhya live there and there now harishchandra was quite old enough there they coronated rohita the son of harishchandra as the next king of ayodhya and finally harishchandra and his wife shaivya they went to heaven so because of this story of harishchandra and the things that he did in his life that's why we have the picture also the movie that also that comes in satyavan harishchandra harishchandra we say the first movie is there anyone you have seen the movie harishchandra no one has seen yes sir you have seen in childhood you would have seen very very old raja movie raja harishchandra in marathi yeah raja harishchandra i think it was a popular marathi movie only i don't know whether it was there in other yes, languages yes. i think in marathi it was there it was there in other languages only it was there right okay yeah, yeah. so i think most of you had seen so now you know the reason why harishchandra is or why even a movie had to be made and that too quite about 50 60 years back 
the reason being that because of his greed that in spite of facing so much also he never kept names to anyone and even when the god themselves came down to take him to heaven at that time also he refused because he was thinking about his subjects and even at that time he remembered that he was under the control of the chandala and he should obey the chandala because chandala was his master so this is a very beautiful story of harishchandra from the markandeya purana next now we uh, continue so did everyone understand the story of harishchandra yes Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, correct. So uh, now, everyone, those who were not, you have not attended the previous session. That is yesterday's session when we were looking at the starting of Markandeya Purana, Shri Vidya Ji and all. Whenever possible, I will be sharing the recording. Go through that once. Listen as you get time. Because only if you listen to the starting part, you can make out. So little, uh, if you listen to that, it will be more clear. So now, yeah. So basically, Markandeya Purana, where the conversation, the birds are telling uh, four birds. Now, how are these birds? The story of birds we saw in the last session. These birds are telling Jaimini. So this is a conversation between four birds and Jaimini. So with this, the story of Harish Chandra ends here. Further, Jaimini he continues. He tells the next that uh, next now you tell me. I we have few more doubts that uh, a child. We know that child or a living being takes birth. It grows in the womb. Either if it is a bird or so, it hatches an egg. Whether if it is human birth, it is born in the womb. So, what is all this like? How does it, the small child, how does it survive inside the womb, and so on? So, what is the story of all this? How does all this happen? So, birds. They said that for this, there is a story. There was a Brahmin. He lived with his son. His son's name was Sumati. The Brahmin told his son that you study the Vedas and everything, and then, uh, saying so, he himself went to the forest. And, uh, but the son did not pay much attention, and still the father used to repeatedly tell the child that you please study. Uh, but still the son always he just simply laughed and said that I know everything. I studied all the Vedas and my previous births and everything, and uh, I suffered thousands of diseases. I have taken birth many times, so everything has been done in my previous births also. I took a birth. I died. I took a birth. Died. So, looking at all this, uh, hearing all this, uh, this Brahman he felt that uh, whatever you are speaking, this is all fine. But then, how come you are speaking like this? Like, no, no child will speak like this, right? I have studied all the Vedas in my previous births. I took taken a birth in my mother's womb so many times and so on. So this is like, you know, great philosophy. So then uh, this Brahmin asks that how come you are speaking all this? From where did you know all this? So at that time Sumati, the boy says that I was a Brahmin in my previous birth. To some extent, I can remember what was there in my previous birth. And uh, at that time, I was blessed with extraordinary memory. So that is the reason. Even after my death in the previous birth, I can remember in this birth also what happened to me. And uh, all the self knowledge and everything that I've taken in my previous birth, I remember all that. So in this birth, I don't have to study the Vedas or anything uh, again because I already remember whatever I had studied in the previous birth. And uh, but still, you tell me what you want to do, and uh, you ask me the ask me some questions if you have because whatever I've studied, I can answer your questions. So then the Brahmin he asked him a, bit, a few questions. He the first answer, first question that he asked was, "Who dies peacefully?" Before birth, this person was interested in knowing about death, like all of us also, right? When will a person die? Or the minute someone tells us that on this so and so day you are going to die, we we'll never live peacefully from this moment, right? So more than birth, if someone is going to tell you some, a birth is still fine, right? Birth we can at least make an estimate. Okay, the child is to live for nine months, or roughly in this month, in the month of July, in the month of August, something they say. The dates can go up and down, but still you get a rough idea. And we are always happy. We are waiting for the date to come. But the case of death, it's not like that, right? It can come any time, anywhere, and none of us we are much interested in that because we know it is quite dangerous, right? So then uh, the same thing happened here also. So then this Brahmin he tells that what happens. Uh, Who dies peacefully? Because usually death is something where um, we always feel that it's a very dreadful experience and so on. So, what are your thoughts on death? So, uh, this uh, Brahmin, this all this question was asked by the Brahmin. 
the father and the son Sumati he answers saying that one who always does good things in his life and who never speaks a lie he is excellent possible he remains happy he remains positive throughout his life if he is positive towards the end also he will die a very happy death that is the reason we say in our lives also always be happy right problems are going to come but then how we face them how far we have a positive attitude that is very very important so the same thing Sumati also tells and um, you should be free from evils like karma, krodha, dvesha, anger, jealousy and so on. So those who have all these qualities and at the same time they give a lot in charity, they do a lot of donations, they all die in peace. And those who cause harm to others, uh, they are going to face, when they die of course they are also going to face problems. So this is how uh, it has been told. So if you do good all through your life, your death will be peaceful. If you do evil deeds all through your life, death, at the time of death also you are going to suffer. So this is a very simple philosophy that Sumati tells his father. Further, the Brahmin says that, okay, so you say that if you do good deeds you go to heaven, if you do bad deeds you are going to go to hell. So can you explain about this in detail? So there, the Brahmin, the Sumati, he continues, he says that if you go to hell, now these are all, this can be a bit disturbing to hear but this is all what has been mentioned because Indian philosophy believes in the concept of life after death about hell different things have been told whatever has been told in the Markandeya Purana I am telling you as it is it can be a bit disturbing and we start wondering what will happen to us but sir this is what we believe in so the Sumati says that those who do now the Brahmin asks a question you tell me something about hell so Sumati says that uh, those who eat inedible things, that is mainly those who consume a lot of non-vegetarian food or you can say wherein we kill some other animals or we kill other creatures like in certain parts of the world wherein even like tribal peoples or so even human beings are also cut and killed or even certain animals and this is the reason why we say non-veg food should not be consumed and of course there is a very scientific reason also that most of the diseases also take place due to consumption of non-veg food and mainly who cheat a lot then who are not very true to their relationships maybe you have a relationship with your parents with your partner and so on but still you maintain with others you are very uh, like you don't remain truthful if you have such behavior then one's own partner we maybe we desert we leave them apart and then you go and stay with someone else all such things or even people who destroy public properties like maybe temples or even gardens or that's the reason today we have big big tags right protect environment global warming this and that all this has been mentioned in the Markandeya Purana years back wherein those who destroy public properties it is said that what is the punishment for all these people Yamaduta, the attendants of Yama they tie the arms and legs of such a person and they throw them into fire it seems and on the way to hell while such people are taken to hell after death such people they are bitten by crows, vultures and so on such uh, creatures that is the reason even a few communities like the Parsi community today how they don't burn the dead body. They, they have, I think, a special pit that is constructed and uh, I think vultures come and they eat the dead body. So this tradition is still followed and in such a condition for thousands of years, the person is given punishment. Then, with this, the punishment does not end. They are shifted to another hell, it seems, which is full of darkness. It is called Tama. And uh, especially sinners who kill cows, Gohatya, Gohatya Dosham, and other cattle, they are all thrown into this hell tama and it is extreme cold, only darkness is there and nothing to eat, drink, everything and it is said that due to the cold environment itself, people die there. These sinners, it seems that till the prayashtita of their sins, like till they get the proper punishment for all the sins that they have committed, they are not removed from this hell. And it's a very sorry state that these sinners, they don't get anything to eat and drink but as human beings or as creatures, we have to fill our stomach. It seems that such a sorry condition, they have to drink their own blood and eat their own flesh. So like this, these are a few things that are told in the Tama hell. Then next Sumati says that there is another hell called the Nikrantana. Here it seems that uh, the sinners, they do here extreme sins, wherein uh, even their different body parts are picked, body parts are removed. Uh, like eyes, ears and so on and then like this extreme severe punishment is given here. 
so with this he talks about different punishments now listening to this now even listening to this all of us also we are a bit disturbed right disturbed but it's not very pleasant to hear so this brahman was also very disturbed and now he starts wondering what what all i did now now here we also now of course none of us we do some terrible sins like go hatya and so on so obviously we don't have to face all this but still even the least of sins that we do uh we feel very bad right let like, even if you maybe talk to someone rudely or things like that we feel very very bad but then there are also extreme sins that people do like go hatya and all that which we consider or even uh maybe some great sins like deserting one's own people not living properly with them all such things we feel that it's very uh we although we don't do it still there are people who do this so for them extreme punishments are given further now sumati he consider continues and he talks about his own story he says that i was born in a family and uh, once it so happened that i was i once prevented cows from drinking water they were drinking water and i stopped them from drinking and because of the sin i was thrown into a hell called daruna where i spent 100 years without water so you would have heard right mostly our grandmothers and everyone they will tell that if we stop people from doing something we will have the same punishment like we they will say right if you maybe treat a dog properly but don't treat a dog properly you will also be born as a dog in the next birth or something like that they tell right with regards to animals and all this so therefore taking care of animals is also very very important bhutadaya so the puranas through this what we understand is that puranas therefore we cannot consider them to be only mere religious texts religion is one part of it but is you can say good behavior or good conduct is something which nobody has to teach us right you have to give water to the cows water to the animals or in general in anything that we do nobody has to come and teach all this to someone though in school and everything for small children is it is taught it is morals but still all such things we don't have to if you drink water similarly the animal also has to drink water if you are eating food the animal also needs food so this is all but understood but people in the markandeya purana it is mentioned that people lack even this knowledge right so that is the reason they torture even animals and other creatures we end up torturing our own fellow human beings right then the next level is animals so therefore we have to be very very careful because if we do this it is all going to lead to hell only sumati so gives this example and uh, next uh, sumati starts continuing so sumati says that one day in hell while i was spending about 100 years without a drop of water at that time we saw a gentleman there were other people also in hell and there was a gentleman he was a very scholarly person and uh, looking at him we never felt that he would have committed a sin ever so we were all surprised looking at such a scholarly person also in hell so we asked this uh, person saying that uh, why are you in hell like uh, have you done something or what it is so at that time the gentleman he replied that uh, the yamadutas who were present there they replied it seems so before this call, now why if someone is taken to hell the person the, didn't know that answer so the yamadutas who were there they replied that you once what you did is your wife pivari her his wife's name was pivari she had conceived but it seems that he had two wives the first wife was pivari second wife was sushobana and uh, the first wife had conceived but because this person this gentleman he had more affection towards the second wife it seems that the first wife was prevented from conceiving that is abortion so this is a sin that you have done this is a reason why today abortion should not be done though we have abortion still being done i don't think uh, much it takes place but still there are people like though it is maybe unplanned or whatever it is you call it but still abortion is a crime it should never be done it is equal to killing a person though it is still not developed but still it is equal to killing a person so unplanned no are not ready for this unplanned pregnancy all such things come in now of course there are a few uh, conditions like medical conditions or so you don't have an option you have to do it then that's a different thing but on purpose when you prevent someone from conceiving or when after a person conceives you try to stop ways or you try to find out the gender of the child and such things we see right so many crimes taking place such things should be done today we have many laws that are passed against all this all this has been mentioned in the puranas thousands of years back and this is all going to lead to crime and sin so that is the reason this gentleman had been brought here and uh,
also the gentleman agrees he says okay this is a crime that i have done so i have to face all this and he agrees but uh, now next question was there were many people who were there and they were all looking like normal human beings only but still they were in hell so it was very surprising to see them so in general all the people there were say, uh, seeing all this they just asked in general the sumati was a witness there he was also standing there so he said that many of them were like we didn't know who will uh, why someone was facing such hell like conditions or why they were even brought to hell like this religious man like this scholar not a religious man a gentleman who was very good to look at a very scholarly person to look at but why he had been brought to hell there was no answer for that but only later we know that he had prevented his wife from conceiving so like this there were many people who looked very good from outside but then they were all in hell so at that time the yamaduta they asked the yamaduta the question that what they have done wrong why are they brought to hell and so on so they said that it depends on one's own karma right whatever actions we do and uh, therefore if you have done some good deeds you will be taken to heaven if you have done some bad deeds of course you are going to be punished so they are depending on one's karma and one's kar- karma's action you know then maybe they have done something evil it might be maybe at a smaller level but still they have to face punishment for that this is the reason why at times whenever we do wrong or at times when a child does wrong also a mild punishment is always given right so the mild punishment maybe the mother will not speak to the child for some time or maybe the child is for some time uh, he'll say that you know you you cannot watch tv for two days or you cannot go to play for two days right so this is not actually punishment but still <coughs> sorry for the child it feels that it is something the world has turned over right oh my i cannot watch tv for two days this is such a grave punishment so from the next time the child will never do that because he knows that oh last time i could not watch tv so this time i cannot do right so why such punishments are given to realize make the child realize that what he or she did was wrong so like this there are also mild punishments also so people depending on the actions that they do once they repent for that once they face punishment for that they can go back to go back they can take a birth on earth again so like this in detail markandeya purana talks about the different sins that are committed and the different punishments for that now next the brahman was hearing to all this and now he t- asked his son that oh now though you are born as my son in this birth you seem to be very knowledgeable so now you advise me i am at my advanced age in life so should i go to the forest and take up sanyasa ashrama or wow what it is so sumati advises that you go to the forest and you need a vanaprasthi vanaprasthi is vanaprasthashma you live in the forest do some meditation penance and so on so that you will study veda study the vedas yoga yoga shastram in general you will have a control over your senses that is slowly you start to retire from this worldly life uh, so now like the brahmana asks that you tell me about the yoga that shows a way to liberation and sumati starts starts talking about the yoga shastra it was told by dattatreya to alarka dattatreya bhagavan dattatreya we call trimurti right datta bhagavan so dattatreya whatever text or whatever teachings he has told to alarka uh he so now this brahmani was surprised he said okay i know about dattatreya he is incarnation trimurti Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, but then who is this Kalarka? So for this there is a story. Sumati says that in in a place there was a Brahmin and uh, he had this disease of leprosy. Leprosy, you know, hands and feet, the fingers, they are not proper. So this is because he had committed a lot of sins in his previous birth. And because of his illness, the Brahmin, now people when they are a bit sick or so, uh, they get very angry, right? That because of the illness, pain. He got irritated. He got angry. So he used to continuously keep telling his wife something. He used to keep shouting at his wife. But still, the wife was very good, and uh, she used to worship him as if a deity. Also, she used to take very good care of her husband, in spite of his angry nature, because she knew that he was not well, and that is the reason why he was behaving like this. So the Brahmin once he uh, said that, "You please uh, carry me to some place from here. I don't want to." Uh, live here at all i would not want to live in this house now Be- being afflicted with leprosy he could not walk properly so he tells his wife you carry me from here and you take me somewhere the wife agrees she carries her husband on her shoulders and uh, it seems that 
uh, it was night time and in the darkness the woman she could not see the road properly and uh, it seemed uh, at that time what happened is the brahmin who was, who was sitting on her shoulders there was a sage also coming by because the woman could not see properly the brahmin by mistake he touched the sage it seems and uh, Uh, the sage got very angry that someone has touched. Now, usually for sage or sages as well as some people, uh, especially while they do the morning puja and so on, like after taking a bath or so and after being fully pure, they don't like someone to touch, right? And we also, if we take a bath or so, usually maybe we do our prayers, worship, puja, and then only we go about doing our daily course. We don't touch anything much. So this course, uh, the sage got very angry that this brahman had touched him. And what he did is, whoever has touched me, that person would die die before sunrise tomorrow. Now hearing this, the Brahmin's wife was shocked. She said, because of my mistake, this my husband has got a curse and she prays to the Lord that tomorrow sunrise should not take place at all. And it seems that words of this woman come true and sunrise did not take place at all. Whole world was in darkness. Now if the sun does not rise in the morning, obviously the world is going to be in darkness and now all the gods started worrying that this is against the law of nature. The sun has to rise every day. And uh, if it doesn't rise, then the whole universe, the whole world is going to be destroyed. So now what should be done? And, uh, so now time cannot be calculated, day, night, everything is going to be disturbed. So everyone was worried. And uh, so why this happened is was because of the chastity. The woman was very, very chaste and pure. And because of her devotion that she had it towards her, that she had towards her husband, this so-and-so incident had happened. Like we have the story of Satyavan and Savitri. Just yesterday we celebrate the, celebrated the Vat Purnima festival, right? So, 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 Savitri, she went to heaven and from the Yamaduta, she brought her husband back because of the devotion to her husband. Right? So, like this, even this woman also because of her devotion to her husband, she could stop even the sun from rising. And uh, what happened is that, so, now Brahma, Brahma, he saw all this and they, Brahma, he told all the gods that, you pray to Anasuya, the wife of sage Atri, you pray to her and you try to please her. And somehow they prayed to Anasuya. Anasuya became happy with the gods and they told him that the, the gods told Anasuya that so and so incident has taken place and so you only have to go and do something. So finally what happened is that now they both this Brahman and wife they were traveling and they reached a far off place. They basically they wanted a change in the environment. They reached a hut nearby and they started living in another place. So Anasuya goes to that the Brahman and his wife's house and she goes and tells the wife that uh, You, I am very happy with the devotion and dedication that you have towards your husband. You keep serving and whatever virtues or good deeds that you are doing, even your husband's good deeds also half merit is going to come to you because of the devotion that you have so much on him. So the Brahmin's wife was very happy and she said, I am really happy that today you have come. All the gods have listened to me. As per my prayers, the sun has not risen today. My husband's life is saved and so on she tells. But uh, now Anasuya, she says that all this is fine, but because the sun has not risen, no one has started with their day course, so many religious activities, sacrifices have been stopped because the sun has not risen, the world is also going to end. So what you have to do is, now that your uh, husband's life is saved, now you please allow the sun to rise. Only then everything can happen. So at that time the Brahmin says that there is a sage. The sage's name is Mandavya. The sage has cursed my husband that he will die with sunrise. So therefore, I cannot lose my husband and therefore, I cannot allow the sun to rise also. So, Anasuya says that don't worry, I will take care of your husband. You just allow the sun to rise. Then, Anasuya, it seems that she invoked the sun and uh, by offering water, by doing tarpana, the sun started. But what happened is that the Brahmin who was afflicted with leprosy, he slowly, he started to, he died as soon as the sun rose. And... Uh, Look, now because to make the curse of the sage true the brahman died as a sun rose but because Anasuya was present there and she had promised the woman that I am going to save your husband she changed that brahmin into a very young young man so the disease also he was free from that leprosy also and he was uh, transformed into a young man and Anasuya she blessed the couple to live for 100 years together all the deities were also pleased with Anasuya and because she had helped him and all the gods tell, that, tell Anasuya that now you ask us a boon because you have done our work and she expressed her desire to give birth to a son who will have the powers of the trinity trinity or the three gods Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and that's how Dattatreya was born and all the three 
gods if you see brahma was born as chandrama vishnu was born as datatreya and mahesha lord shiva was born as durvasa like these three different incarnations have taken place and we consider datatreya one deity mainly of vishnu but to having the forms of all the three gods brahma vishnu and shiva so the birth story of datatreya is given in the markandeya purana now next so this is the story of datatreya now again this sumati he is only telling all these stories to his father so now the next story is kartyavira there was a person called kartyavira we have the famous temple kartyavira arjuna right so like this kartyavira was a person was a king and after he died his son was arjuna and all the ministers and the subjects they decided to crown arjuna as the next king but arjuna said that i don't want to become a king because i want to become a yogi i want to attain powers i want to do a lot of penance and so on so until and unless i attain the status of a yogi i am not going to become the king and at that time sage garga garga acharya so garga he tells arjuna that you start worshiping lord datatreya he will guide you uh, how you have to become a yogi so that later you can become the king and uh, hearing to all this arjuna goes to datatreya he meets now this is this arjuna is different not from the mahabharata reference he begins to worship datatreya and datatreya asks arjuna you give me a boon and uh, this arjuna said that you bless me with such a powers that as a king i should always rule in a very just and in a very fair manner and i should have a thousand arms and i should be killed by a person only by that person who will be more virtuous who will have more good qualities than me and i should always guide my people in the right path there should be no unfair means nothing so everything should be very happy and uh, nobody in my kingdom should be poor and uh, my devotion i will i should always be devoted to your lotus feet lotus feet so these are a few things that arjuna asks datatreya datatreya says that all your wishes will be fulfilled and then datatreya he only crowned arjuna as the next king and large number of people had come and soon after this this is how the name was kartyavira arjuna kartyavira arjuna he tells that after becoming the king kartyavira arjuna he tells us uh, people that there should be no violence at all except him that is except the king himself if needed nobody should ever lift the weapon that is ultimately it means that no violence should take place so there were all a few stories that sumati was telling the brahman next story he tells that i'm going to talk about alarka now you remember first only they talked about the conversation of dattatreya and alarka <coughs> sorry so now he tells the story of alarka there was a king called shatrujit who had a son ritudvaja now be careful with the names in order to remember the names you will have to listen to the audio a few times shatrujit was a king his son was ritudvaja and uh, this ritudvaja the prince he had many friends he used to play with all of them and uh, it seems that the king of nagas snakes uh, two of his sons the naga kings two sons of the naga ashwatthara two sons of ashwatthara ashwatthara was a king of nagas snakes serpents so his sons also the king of nagas ashwatthara his son also was uh, he had their his sons were also disguised though they were serpents they are disguised in the form of boys and they used to also play with this prince ritudvaja and his friends so oh, this naga princes both of them they were very happy they used to spend their time with ritudvaja here and there and uh, they used to return to patal loka the nagas live in the patal loka so during night time they used to return back to their home and uh, one fine day it so happened that uh, their father called him and asked that every day you are returning so late in the night what do you do the whole day where do you go the naga king ashwatthara asked the boys so he says that uh, so the boys they said that up there on earth there is a prince ritudvaja he is very handsome very good so we like spending his time we enjoy his company and uh, ashwatthara also is very happy listening to this he says that okay my sons are also happy playing with this boy and uh, he tells that okay now that you feel very happy to spend time with this prince ritudvaja uh, have you done anything for him to make him happy or have you gifted him something so the sons answered that what we can do like uh, we don't know what to do because we are nagas right what we will do to make him happy i don't know so you only suggest so they tell their father that you only suggest something so that we can make our son happy so ashwatthara he says that okay i will suggest but before that you tell me something more about your new friend that is new friend that is ritudvaja 
So for this, these sons now the Naga sons they start telling a story. What is the story? Uh, this story they tell that this prince Rikudwaja had only told us one day the same story they are now telling to their father Ashwatthara, the king of Nagas. So there was a Brahmin. Now this is a story that they tell. There was a Brahmin called Galava who was living in this kingdom, in the king, Shatrujit's kingdom, and he arrived in the kingdom's court, uh, in the king's court, and he tells the king that a demon is troubling me for many months now, and uh, he can even take the form of different elephants, uh, elephants, horses, different animals. So and he is causing a lot of trouble. And uh, what happened uh, is that uh, it's very difficult for me to focus on my meditation and all that. I'm trying to do so many things. This Brahmin Galava he comes and comes and tells his king. So. Um, he comes and tells shatrujit now what will do uh, what to do now you please help so shatrujit tells that okay i will try my best to help but then it is very difficult like if the person if the demon is can assume any animal forms and so on still i will try my best so at that time this person brahmin this galava he says that i have a horse with me his name is kovalaya and you can use it you can ride on this horse and you can try to kill this uh, demon so i have brought this horse along with me and you can accept it and you instruct your son, that is your son Ritu Dvaja, you ride on it and you kill the demon. And uh, once it so happened uh, that this now this the Naga sons are telling the story. So Ritu Dvaja, he accepts the horse and along with the Brahmin, he goes riding that horse. And uh, for a few days, this Ritu Dvaja, he stays in the hermitage of the sage Kalava he uh, to protect the from sacrifices, just as Rama and Lakshmana had accompanied Vishwamitra. Similarly, this prince Ritu Dvaja had accompanied the sage Galava to protect his sacrifices. So, at that time, the demons, they were not aware that this Ritu Dvaja is there. And as a wild boar, the demon this time, he assumed the form of a boar and he came there. And, uh, and immediately Ritu Dvaja saw and he went there and all the other demons, he injured this wild boar demon. The Ritu Dvaja tried to injure him. All the other demons had also come over. Now they all ran away from the scene because they were very much afraid. And uh, wherever now this demon also started running. So Ritu Dvaja also followed wherever it went, mountains, forests, rivers, here and there, the demon in the form of the boar started running. And Ritu Dvaja was also following this demon. And uh, ultimately what happened is that uh, there was a pit, PIT pit. So the boar it jumped into the pit and Ritu Dvaja also followed and he was also about to jump in the pit. But when he went inside the pit, when he fell inside the pit, he could not see the boar anywhere. Instead, he saw another town there, T-O-W-N, town. It was a very beautiful place. It was like Indra Loka only. And there he saw a pretty girl also. And uh, Ritu Dvaja immediately, he followed her and he saw this girl sitting. And uh, she was very beautiful to look at. And uh, the girl also looked at Ritu Dvaja and she fainted. Because suddenly she was shocked to see Ritu Dvaja there. So then the girl, uh, Ritu Dvaja consoled the girl and said that uh, why you are getting unconscious, like I am no one, I am just a human being, right? So at that time, uh, what happened, like pr this prince Ritu Dvaja, he is shocked, he doesn't know what to do. So then this princess, uh, she says that I am just by looking at you, I am shocked because in this place usually nobody comes as such and suddenly you came, so that is the reason I am uh, shocked. So she tells and she goes away from there. And, uh, but still, now still Ritu Dvaja was not happy with this answer. He felt that this is not an answer, right? So then uh, there were a few friends of this girl also. So what happened? He just goes and asks the girl's friends also that why is this girl fainting? Like it's okay. She says that I'm surprised to look at you. But I feel that there is some other reason. Is there some other reason? So the friends, uh, she, uh, friends of the girl, they say that uh, she's actually the daughter of Vishwavasu. Vishwavasu is the king of Gandharvas. She is the daughter of this Gandharvas and her name is Madalasa. Madalasa. And once it so happened that she was playing in the garden and that time a demon, he abducted her. Abducted her. So this is actually the place of a demon. Uh, and there now she is staying here and it is said that on, in the next 13 days the demon is going to marry her away. So therefore she is very afraid when someone comes she faints and falls and so on. So but now she's that's the reason she's very worried she has only one very few friends here we are a few girls who are living here and she's actually the daughter of uh, the gandharva so she should live in swarga loka but she has been bought her so we have a few friends who live with her apart from that she is uh, 
she is all alone here and she is about to get married to a demon too so that's the reason that uh, she feels very right? she feels very afraid when she looks at someone and uh, what happened is uh, so looking at all this now ritu dhoja was quite convinced with this answer and uh, he tells that who is this demon so i you just tell me the name of the demon i am ready to kill so then the girls they say that it is the same demon who has assumed the form of a boar now his name is actually patala ketu patala ketu he has assumed the form of the boar the same demon that you were chasing you have come to the right place but so this was you can see the he was is actually a prince immediately as soon as he entered the pit when he fell into the pit he changed his form so that is the reason you could not find the boar and you felt that you have come to some other land you have come to the same place the demon has changed his form now he has taken a human form and now this girl Uh, she is our friend, and when you were just while away, you were just coming. She saw you chasing the wild boar, so now she wants you to kill the wild boar so that she need not have to marry the woman. Wild boar is actually the original demon with whom she is going to get married. So, you please now you tell your identity, who you are, where you belong, and so on, so that uh, you can tell it to the prince, princess, and she'll be very happy. So Ritu Dwaraja says, "I am the son of King Shatrujit. I am staying in this hermitage of the sage Galava." to protect the sages and so on few days back a uh, boar came there and that's how i started following and i have arrived here hearing the words of this uh, ritu dwaja this madala sa the girl sh- she was uh, who was standing nearby she felt very shy and at the same time she was very happy because she knew that now she need not have to marry this uh, demon and so on she was very happy and uh, at that time all the friends of her also they go and say that see now your words are going to be true so now what you can uh, do is you be very happy now ritu dwaja immediately he goes and he kills this demon patala ketu so already he had shot an arrow at the wild boar so already the demon was a bit injured so only little part was remaining to lose his life and finally ritu dwaja kills so k- killed the demon patala ketu now all the boys the, the girls who are present there they tell ritu dwaja that you can marry now this woman who is there madalasa she is a daughter of the king of gandharvas vishwavasu but uh, ritu dwaja he was so you marry her and you can take her home as your bride ritu dwaja he was a very righteous prince he says that uh, i am ready to marry but without the permission of her father i cannot marry right so and at the same time i am just a small prince now i'm just playing around with my fellow friends and so on so i cannot marry so but the with the girls of friends who are there they say that no you have to marry immediately otherwise it is very dangerous because already she has come down from heaven and she is all alone living here and at the same time you, you don't know what happens if some other demon or someone comes so you have come at the right time you can marry uh, so prince ritu dwaja somehow he marries this uh, woman madalasa and takes her and madalasa now she remembered their priest tumbaru tumbaru is also gandharva he was a priest of gandharvas in heaven and tumbaru he she calls tumbaru and the gandharva system of marriage that is it they do that marriage and thereafter the ritu dwaja and madalasa they start living with each other and they the horse that the brahmin had given the sage gal galava galava had given they rode on that horse and they came back and they, they came back to the kingdom to the father shatrujit ritu dwaja ritu dwaja tells everything shatrujit was very happy that his son was also married and new the promise that he had killed the demon and so on and both of them they started to live happily now what happens further let's look uh, in the next week